Good, after- okay, good afternoon, Alan McElvain. Hi, Martin. How, hi. How are you today? Well, well pronounced. Well done. <laughs> You'd think I'd been rehearsed now or something, right? So uh, <laughs> You would think so. I, I know. How are you this afternoon? Sunday afternoon at quarter past four. What's your normal afternoon on a Sunday afternoon? Well, since I've come back to Scotland, this pretty much is my normal afternoon, yeah. actually. Catching up on people, usually in Zoom or something like that. Is it? Um, yeah, because I haven't, since I came back in September... Is it? I haven't actually seen any of my pals yeah, at all. Yeah, unbelievable, isn't it? So, yeah, crazy times. And so, where have you been? You've just back... Is it Hungary or at? I, I was in Hungary for four years, and then before that, I was in Belgium for wow. 10 years. So, I've been away away from Scotland for 14, 15 years now. Yeah. Wow, well, that's incredible, isn't it? Are you happy to be back? Yeah. So, Oh, absolutely delighted. Oh, yeah. I've, I've never enjoyed anything as much as lockdown. It's, <laughs> it's fun, fun, fun. Yeah, I guess that's difficult. But, yeah, I suppose, does it, are you, are you, were you happy? How did, how was it getting back? I guess the country wasn't in lockdown at the time you came back into the Scotland. Came back in. Did you fly into Edinburgh I, I as well? Had to do the, I had to do the um, 14 days quarantine right. thing or self-isolation. Yes. But it, it wasn't so bad. I mean, I, I live on my own, so I was actually still allowed to go out to the shops yeah. to get food and things like that. Um, wow. But yeah, you, I suppose you also get used to home deliveries and things like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, loads of takeaways, loads of home deliveries, lots of Netflix, catching up on British TV, which I hadn't seen for years. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and as a result, I'm a wee fat yet now. <laughs> and how is it? Um, how is it? How is it police that the other thing, the quarantine thing? It, it, was there any policing? It was it just a conscience thing, or was it police did to get it calls? What to- it was a totally conscience thing. Was I was actually, it was really bad. I thought I, I, it's no wonder we had such a a pandemic and such a bad uh, response in UK mm. because basically. I had to fill out this form before I came back. Mm-hmm. I got to Edinburgh Airport. Nobody checked me. I was asking people, who do I go to pass this form to? Uh, nowhere, I'll just keep going. Mm-hmm. So you just basically walked through Edinburgh Airport, uh, went to the bus, because I had to get a bus back to Glasgow. So straight away, I'm mixing wow. with 20 other people. And then once I got back to Glasgow, then a bus to where I live. Wow. So again, you know, you know so yep. probably at that time I could have passed it on to 40 uh-huh. or 50 And people. in that two weeks you never heard from anybody? You didn't get a text, you didn't get a phone call, you got absolutely no, nothing? No text, no phone call. Isn't nothing. that incredible? Not a thing. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. You imagine all sorts. So I think we were, we were a little bit late in uh, trying to stop people moving about. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let's get into the into my questions, really, just to get a bit of background on you, if that's okay. I'm really interested in the in the future, in the current and the future. But if I could get a bit of background as to where where you started with badminton, I suppose let's start with the traditional questions. Your full name? My full name's Alan John McIlvain. Okay. Uh, John's taken from my grandfather on my mother's side. Good. Yeah. Nice. And your age? Oh. Uh, believe it or not, because I know I look really young, uh, I'm 59. 59, yeah, she looked pretty good for to be fair. Uh, your home area? Yeah, <laughs> and your... I came back, I came back from my bus, <laughs> that was the reason I came back. That's good. And your home area, where are you from originally? I'm from, I've always been a West End Glasgow okay. guy, so I've always been around Scotston. I've now just moved over a little bit towards Clydebank. So I'm in Yoker, which is between Scotsland and Clydebank. I know that I know Yoker very well. In fact, I, well. I grew up. I grew up in the same street as the National Academy is now. Oh, really? I lived there for about 20, 23 years. Wow! And and when did you? Uh, sorry, just uh, come on about them. Did your brothers or sisters? I've got one sister. One sister. She's older. Is she? Does she play or did she play? No, she doesn't play at all. She's not not sporty in the slightest. No. It was my my father played a little bit, okay. uh, just probably same as a lot of others. He he was in the church club, right? And he started a junior section at the church club, so basically he taught me how to play. 
That was very local um, to again, where you lived, Alan, was it? Yeah, again, that was just well, a five-minute walk from where I, from where I nice. stayed. Um, and did, was he yeah. a club player, was he? Or? No, not not even mm -hmm. a club player, just a social player. Oh, yeah. um, but he had been hitting shuttles from the age of seven. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, I was playing, playing for yeah, way too many years which the knees and the hips are now telling yeah, me every day. Everybody's the same. Most of us, as we get to this, it's. Uh, I, was talk yeah. I was talking to Jim Miller. He says his. He says my knees are dust. He said he just. He just says he can't. Uh, can't turn. Can't play badminton at all. He plays golf okay, but it doesn't know. Terrible. It's a shame, isn't it? And did you? Did yeah. you love? Did, did you love badminton? I, I mean, uh, the... did Sorry? you love badminton from the outset? Yeah, yeah, just right, right from the outset, it was something I really liked. I still think it, it's one of the one of the great things about badminton is there's no real, there's no set frame. Um, you know, there's there's no set. Um, you don't need to be six foot two to play, or you don't need to be a gymnast like size side or tiny. You can play from any height. Yes. It just has everything has advantages and disadvantages. I agree. When you're smaller, you've got to jump a bit more. When you're taller, you're maybe a bit slower at twisting and turning. Yeah, it is amazing, so, isn't it? So, but, yeah, if you look at tennis, I mean, nobody's going to win a a grand slam in tennis now unless they're over six foot. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah, but badminton, you've still get taller guys, smaller guys. Yeah, you know, it's all. Did you did so you do any other sports as well? I was quite happy with that. Did you do any other sports as well? Yeah, I did everything. To did be you? honest, my my dad was very keen that I, I tried everything. It's good, isn't it? You know, so I played some football. I did cricket, even. Mm -hmm. um, it also, I think it also depends on your uh, basically your PE teachers in school yeah. or what was available to you in school. So at my school, we had. Football, rugby, cricket, no badminton, funnily mm. enough. Uh, no, none of the teachers did badminton at all. Which was, it was a shame because that probably held me back quite a lot in how I developed as a player. And what, um, now what, what age did you yeah, start playing as well? Badminton. What age was that when you started? I started when I was seven. I did started you? when I was did seven. You? Yeah. And basically I just played... Played every Tuesday, I think, and the the juniors were in Thursday, the seniors were in Tuesday, and because I was reasonable, I was allowed to play with the seniors. Yeah, well, really. What what kind of uh, what kind of hall yeah. was it? Was it a church hall? What was it you played in? It was a one one court church hall with a stage <laughs> as the back line. <laughs> That's a nut. Bro. So one one side had the stage as the back line, and the other side had the I think the pipes of the heating as the back line. Honestly, it's, so, I don't know. The world has changed. I don't know if that still happens. I don't know if there are clubs that are still going churches. I know. In, I, I really don't know. I, know. I mean, I, I still played. I still, I still played Glasgow churches till I was about thirty on. Do they actually um, play in churches? Yeah, yeah, they play in the the small side hall next to the church. Yeah, so there was most of these. I I played in a club called Lint House in Govan, right. um, and basically it was a, a tiny side hall next to the church, and it had um, steps up to the stage. So again, the stage was the back line, yeah. and you had steps up on either side. That's right. So if you were flicking it into the back corner, <laughs> usually all the opposition were shitting themselves <laughs> to break their rackets. That's exactly what we had. It's just what you had at our age. The, uh, honestly, so it was good, good to learn tactics. These kids don't know they're born, do they? They don't know they're born. They don't know what... Oh, exactly. Goodness, the younger they have a girl clue when, when I were a lad. That's, That's brilliant. <laughs> uh, so, what, so what was your main influence, you think, in starting to play? Uh, definitely was my it? dad. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, without him teaching me, I wouldn't have. I mean, it was, he had no coaching knowledge at mm -hmm. all. Um, but I think he either talked to somebody who taught him what to do, or he was reading a book or something, um, or he was just telling me from how he played. Yeah. And did he coach anybody else, um, or was it just you? Oh. No, just like some of my pals did he? as well. I mean, it was just very much the people who were at the church. Was it? 
or their kids. Yeah. That's so that's so good, yeah. isn't it? That's isn't that fantastic? And do you remember the quick next question was, do you remember your first ever racket? Yep, I've still got my Have first you? ever racket. Oh. Yeah, it's an old wooden Lumley's I can't remember that Super Serve or something like that. Lumley's. I think the the story I got was that uh, they were made in the shipyards for a sports shop. Lumley's was the sports shop. What? They were made in a shipyard? And they were they were made in a shipyard. That was the story I got. Father, my dad was just telling me the rubbish he knows. That's good. Uh, what's your first ever and racket? From the rubbish he has told me over the years, I'm pretty sure it is. And your first club, do you remember that? Um, yeah, it would have been that White Inch and Methodist badminton club, which was that church. But it wasn't really a club. It didn't play in in any leagues or anything like yeah, that. Social. So the, the first club that I played in that actually played that organised yes. badminton in a league would have been Victoria Drive School. And that was an after-school yeah, club good. that played in the Glasgow Youth Leagues of that And time. what age were you then? I would have been 15 or 16. So you've had, so you've so, had years of playing every week before that? I had years of playing every week, but just at my local dad's. Yes, uh, uh, Just at my, Your dad my at the White End, yeah. Yeah, um, so basically, actually, I didn't really improve, to be honest, really? from when yeah. I was about 10 until I was about 16, 17. Wow. I, I didn't play my first tournament until I was under 19. And were you a diehard player? Did you go every single week in all of those years? Did you go all the time? Oh, yeah. I, I was desperate to play. I loved it. I loved um, it. I used to used to do shadow work. Did you? I tell some of my players this and they just laugh at me. I used to do shadow work in my bedroom. Did you? Wow. And my bedroom was above my parents' living room. <laughs> so they absolutely loved me practicing my lunges and stuff like That's that. That's amazing, isn't it? That's, uh, in all that time. Yeah. And what about, you must have all, in that time, you must have had hankerings for tournaments. And Did you play any tournaments? Did you go anywhere to play against no, anyone? No, actually, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know any better. Really? I didn't know anything apart from outside this church club. Really? And there, there was nobody at my school that played uh, organised badminton. So as I say, I was really late to the party oh. trying to play tournaments. So basically, this um, the this the after school club, which was on Mondays, a guy called Joe Norwood. And you've heard this story through Craig Robertson and all these other players. You know, there's one or two guys that influenced them That's a lot. Right. Well, Joe Norwood was my was guy. He? he was a guy that, yeah, he was a sports leader. He wasn't really a coach, yeah. but he would go down there every Monday. He would organise the players. Awesome. You would pay 50 pence, 50 pence for your three hours badminton. Um, we had just, at that point, my school had just built a a new games hall so we actually had a three court quite high games hall so we were really yeah, lucky well. at that time because you didn't have that and, that, and what was um, Joe Norwood's background where did he come from I, I really don't know I don't know no um, and he was he was a guy that I lost touch with uh, once I moved on to other Places. other mm. clubs and things like that so um, I don't I don't really know but, but I think he just did. I think he was like Bob. He just did youth work, yeah. like Bob Willett. Yeah, yeah, no, I think. Yeah. You know, I've got these guys about that. You know, I don't. I don't know if I'd agree with that. I don't think there's enough for those guys about. Actually, to be honest with you, but no, I think he's. Um, yeah, yeah, I think there's. Um, there's. You know, everybody's quite keen on developing players who are. You know, but maybe there's just not enough grassroots kind of people just getting kids into it and getting them to love it before they like you did. You know, your dad got you to love it. Yeah. You know, you went and you probably went to be with your dad when he was when you were growing up, and that's what he did. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, yeah, so I don't know if that's um, I don't know how much of that exists now. I certainly don't see um, teachers taking after school clubs for badminton nowadays. You know, no, but in, in fairness, in fairness to them, it gets it's getting harder and harder for them to do of these things. So, no. There's so many restrictions put in nowadays. I know. I know. 
and, and it's it's for the right reasons. But I think we, as a country, I think we go over the top. Yeah, I agree. I just, I mean, that that thing. I mean, it's a common story. Everybody I've spoke to, or there was this club after school that we went to, and all my pals went, and we went and we had a laugh. And the bath teacher took it. The drama teacher took it. The whoever took the class took the bab took the badminton after school. That that somebody creating that love for it because inevitably, I don't know what you're like, but by the time you're at home. It's over. Like I go to badminton when I go to play badminton now. Even I go from work and I go to play badminton, and then I come home after badminton. If it comes that I have to come home and then go to badminton, I nearly never go. You know that, and yeah. it's probably the same yeah. with school and badminton as well. I think people going straight from what well, we've got, we've got badminton after. You know, people. Why can they do it with football, for example? But I, I, I don't you know, know. I don't you know. know. But to be, to be honest, at that time, I would have I would have crawled over hot coals to go and play badminton. Really, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just loved it. Absolutely loved it. So you must have been. Uh, I, I imagine that when you were like fifteen and sixteen, and you've gone on to this um, Victoria club, that you're probably quite good. Um, but you kind of scrambled your way up there. Would you say? At, at a local level, I was good at a local level. Yes. Yes, and um, and my I suppose my badminton career and definitely big asterisks on the career uh, as a player um, was very much about keeping on moving on to another level. Exactly. You know, so once once I got good in that club, um, I then Joe also did a Sunday club, uh, which was in a place near Knightswood which was about a 45-minute walk for me. Wow. Um, so I used to do that Sunday mornings, uh, go down, walk there, and then walk back again. Did you? Because uh... uh, that meant I could save my bus there to buy something instead. Yeah. So do you, so do you um, think that was kind of, do you think you were kind of, uh, all those years, I'll just think about all those years when from the age of seven and going playing with your dad and then kind of having this revelation of going to the Victoria Club and thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. And at that point, did you think, wow, I really love this? And before you just liked it, or what, did you, how did you feel when you were at that Victoria Club and you walked in there and you saw other players that, I guess you saw other people that had been playing it in all or other places, did you? Or... Yeah, yeah, there were guys that there were guys that were better than me. Yes, and you hadn't had so that. It was, and I hadn't really I had see. that uh, at my at my good. dad's club. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? And I, I always like uh, I'm quite a competitive wee yeah. guy, or I used to be a, yeah. quite a competitive yeah, yeah. wee guy. The the typical small Glasgow guy who wants to beat up all the big guys. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? That's um, and you'd met you'd yeah, probably so more so because you'd missed it for all those years. You didn't have it, and then when yeah. you found it. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's what kept my uh, it kept me wanting to play longer and longer. You know, like guy, guys like Kevin, um, Kevin Stango, yeah. who was a good friend of mine. That um, once I got into junior tournaments and got to meet Kevin, uh, I used to stay at his house through in Edinburgh, and he would stay at mine in Glasgow and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, just these guys had all grown up with it and played quite a lot when they were younger. I could never get enough yeah. play when I was younger. Yeah. So I was just desperate to go and find another club and another club and another And a club. tournament and all of these things. And a tournament. And yeah, and I was just playing catch up all the time. It's good, isn't it? Um, but it, it was good because it, it kept, my, kept my enthusiasm going. You very often find with the, the younger players They've been the big, the big guy all through the junior tournaments, yes. and then all of a sudden, when it comes to eighteen, nineteen, they start to get beat, yeah. and then they lose the mojo, they lose the enthusiasm for it, and they yeah they lose it to sport. I was the exact opposite. I was trying to beat these guys on my way up all the time. Yeah. It's a common theme that it's a common theme of everybody, and that's why I push so hard on trying to find out who the main influences were and who was that guy that you, that you couldn't beat. You know that that just somebody. It's nearly always somebody, an older brother or a friend or somebody. It's nearly always somebody that's a couple of years older. Nearly always a couple of years. Oh, older. I've, I've got a hell of a long list of guys. <laughs> that beat, a hell of a long list. <laughs> I don't believe but that. But I would still, that I would still love to try. Yeah, uh, it's uh, d I, the thing I love about badminton is that you, I mean, like I say, I'm, I'm such a critic 
I'm such a critic of Bob, of really exceptional Batman players. <laughs> In my mind, I'm so much better than everybody I know. So, however, however, I'm not. Uh, let's go back to questions. Uh, the haul you've covered. How much did it cost you? What did it say? It was fifty pence. A, a, fifty pence for three that Victoria hours Club. Wow, wow. Playing, playing with really, really crappy Carrollton shuttles. Yeah. I mean, so, the the plastics yeah. were so bad that they they would always break around the towards the cork. Yes. And we would actually glue them together with wow. super glue just to get a bit longer out <laughs> of them. Wow, uh, that's a sh- that's wow. Mavis three hundred is that's what that's kind of what I remember somehow. Oh, Mavis three hundred, that was that was the dream. But I know. But do you remember? Forget, I've talked about them. it. I've talked about it a lot. Do you remember? Do you remember the kind of getting a new one? That's what I remember. <laughs> it's getting a new one out of a tube. That was like the dream. That was getting the yeah. one new one. And I think a tube would last a week. A tube would last a night, right? A whole tube would last over a night, I reckon. <laughs> Actually, the way Joe ran his club, a tube would last about three years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can play singles, boys, but you'll be using these. That's what I used to get. <laughs> uh, uh, we, so who was your first ever coach? Uh, your dad was obviously massively influential, and in, I think he was probably that Boo Boola guy that made you love her. And who was your first ever coach? Was that Joe Norwood? Was he your first uh, coach? Joe Norwood, yeah, yeah. But to be honest, again, I, I would say he was more of an organiser than a coach. Good, yeah. He didn't really, he didn't really tell you much about strokes or tactics. But what he, what he did was um, the same as a lot of club. You had a good court, and the best players were in the top court, and then the not so good, and it worked its way down. Yes. And one of the good things was that the best players were always pretty good at handing out advice. Um, so really? there was guys that were a bit older than me, uh, David Dawson. Uh, John McCarter, he was from uh, Lanark, I think, but all these guys were quite happy to hand out advice and, and to give you a wee game now and again. Brilliant, isn't it? Uh, and I was always, I suppose I was always one of these wee fighters and they would be quite happy to run me about the court because they knew I wasn't going to take the half, I was just going to fight away and try and get some points. And I think you get to the bit where I don't know about you, but I remember getting to the bit where if I went, I knew who was going to be there. And if I knew that if I went early, for example, I could get a game of singles with somebody that I wouldn't expect. Or if I knew who was going to go, I would normally be the first one there. And inevitably the first one there, you get singles because everybody else hasn't turned up yet in a, on a yeah. club. Did you watch, did you listen to Leslie Jewett? Well, yeah, yeah, I know Wes well. Yeah, I've known Wes over the years. Did you hear him talk about the seven, his club with 70 people on it? Um, I didn't get that. Oh, you need, a, you, need a listen, you need a listen to that. I used to go to a club and it was that busy. There were 70 people in the club in Dumfriesshire. There were 70 people turned up on a club night and there, there, okay. were, there were a lot of 10 minutes. The game will last and 10 that, minutes and there was a yeah. board up and they had the names of everybody. Right, you're next. And there was an organiser that said, they're the 10 past, like golf, right? 7 o'clock, 7.10, 7.20, 7.30. Yeah. And whatever the score was, whoever was winning, you just come off. <laughs> that was it, yeah. It was that many people. That's incredible, right? That was great. It was quite yeah. interesting. How uh... I, I used to I used to coach at a club like that in Scotch. Did you? Um, we had a, a club. I used to coach with a guy called Tommy Hepburn, right. and uh, he, me Tommy ran it like that as well. Really? It was a military operation. I tell you, I, it, with, with seventy people, what else are you gonna do? It's uh, so put, well. I, there's nothing else you no. can do. It's, that's the way. It that is. Everybody and he was saying that you know if you it, heaven forbid if you were like ten past seven and you went to be on and you weren't there or you're up on the fruit machine or something. Like that. He said it was a nightmare. It was quite interesting. Uh, yeah. So do, do you remember your first tournament? Uh, my first tournament was the West, and I can't remember if it was under eighteen or under nineteen at that time because the age groups changed. So it might have been under eighteen. So it was the West Junior under 18, and I think that was at Linwood. Was that? Can I ask you a question about East and West, right? So yeah. I play in Edinburgh, right? And there's there's uh, there seems to be there's, there's quite a big divide in badminton now it, between Edinburgh and Glasgow. I would say the people that play in Ed, in you know you very seldom play, see people. You know, here I've got friends that play from Glasgow that play in Glasgow, um, but it just, 
the club level, the club badminton doesn't seem to be as popular in the West as it is in the East now. The East, there's still lots of clubs that run in Edinburgh, but I don't actually think it exists so much in the West now. Do you think about, what do you think about that? Um, well, it could well be. I mean, I've, I've been out the country for a long ah, time. I suppose so. There, there, was always, there was always a huge rivalry between East and was West. That? Yeah, and it was always like... Um, People would complain about national selections, that the selectors would favour some from the west or they would favour some from the east. Really? Um, but I mean that. Yeah. I suppose that if you're not pleasing anybody, you're probably doing something okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess so. But uh, there was always that divide. But I think, I think Edinburgh used Metal Bank a lot better than Glasgow used. We only had. Oh, I think Bell Houston was probably the only sports centre when I was younger, right. and they didn't really encourage clubs to no. get bought bookings. So you didn't really have all the clubs were literally in the church halls yeah. in Glasgow. Yeah, that. Where it's Edinburgh, you, you seem to have. Um, yeah, that facility. Metal Bank, they had quite a lot of clubs, and then I think there was other games halls mm. that. You know, bigger holes that had clubs as well. But now you look at it. Now look at Scotston compared to everywhere else. It's just absolutely incredible. Colburn Centre. And, yeah, and but Scot Scotston only happened when I was twenty odd. Yeah, I guess so. Maybe, maybe even thirty. I don't know. Yeah. Um, your first time in tournament, so the under eighteen. So what event was that? Singles, doubles, mix. What? What Sing are you? Singles and doubles. I played singles and doubles. I was. I wanted to be a singles player. Yeah. Um, I, I was a decent doubles player. But you loved singles. I loved singles. I just loved the yeah running about and killing myself. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I I still love it. And a couple of years ago, we started a club before my club. Um, the like the club up nomads in Edinburgh play in the the, the place in George's school, and they've actually got the hall from six o'clock till ten at night. Right, they've actually got okay. four hours, and you know most people wouldn't really make it till seven o'clock, eight o'clock, really. And it was kind of doubles, with so it's a really good club actually. And the hall's good, and it's cheap, and everything. It's a brilliant club. Anyway, so but between six and seven, I discovered there was a an opportunity, right, for people that maybe want to play singles, right. So I started a club, a singles club, between six and seven, and <laughs> by the by seven o'clock, I was absolutely. <laughs> 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 and I remember, kid, I remember getting it to about eight o'clock, and the club was running till ten. I'm getting to eight o'clock after having played singles for an hour, doubles for one hour, and still having two hours to go. And thinking, I can't do this. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear. But yeah, I do love singles, and there's quite a few people that young. I guess the younger ones are still still good. I know a lot of people that just love singles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even. Yeah, I, I just loved the I loved the end of a singles game when you were absolutely knackered. Oh, yeah. You know, you had a really good run around. That was it was a really good feeling. I don't mind getting thumped at singles. I don't mind it at all. I do not mind getting thumped. No problem. Yeah. I, well, base, basically for me, it was more just about how how hard I had worked. Yeah. If I, I I didn't mind losing a good game if if I was on for an hour or whatever. Yeah. Oh God! Yeah. An hour, I imagine. Used that. to have some good battles with Colin Campbell, actually. Did you? Did you yeah. really? Because neither, neither of us had a smash. Really, so your touch players. The games, games tended to last for quite a while. And it was the old system where you didn't have. Oh, I know it was incredible. It'd gone for an hour. A single game, a single end could go on for thirty minutes. It was just <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, you were you were love all for thirty <laughs> minutes with the serve changing. I love that. Uh, the tournament uh, most successful event. Yeah, that covers the event. So singles and doubles. Uh, and who was who is your doubles partner? Um, I had various over the years. Um, I started with a guy called John Murdoch, who that was in that first tournament, the first junior tournament. John was a good Glasgow player. Um, at the time, better than way better than me. Really? So I was quite fortunate to get that. Yeah. Um, I think I had a car at the time, so I think that's how I managed to get a, dub, a doubles partner. <laughs> You picked him up, and was he your so was, was he your club? Was he the, was he the Victoria Club as well? No, he was um, through this Victoria Club. This uh, horizons get broadened a bit, basically because 
in one of the matches, uh, a girl came along. It was a, a league where you could use like three girls and three guys, or four guys and two girls, five guys, one girl. Yeah. Whatever the team was, you could just mix it up. And this team came along from North Kelvin side, and I really fancied one of the girls in the <laughs> team. And basically, I, I found out her name and found out where they played, um, and then went and tried to play at their club or her club. And through through her, I actually then managed to get meet an awful lot of other people because she was pretty good. <laughs> that's I like that a lot. <laughs> So uh, that's a good story. Uh, and who was who was your main competition? Would you say growing up when you were when you were, I guess from sixteen to kind of under eighteen, who was the who were the? Well, John John would have been John Murdoch would have been a guy that I wanted to try and beat. Really? But there was a guy in the Drumchapel leagues that I always wanted to beat, a guy called Dougie McBriar. Um, a lot of your badminton guys will have heard of Dougie McBriar. Really? And do these people still play John Murdoch, Dougie McBriar? Do they still play? Dougie, Dougie, I think, still plays um, in the Veterans County stuff. Mm. Do- Dougie was a maverick, shall we say? That's a kind word for him. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean? Go and explain that. He was, he was always like he would turn up with. I remember him playing, I think, the Nationals with a pair of Mickey Mouse underpants and <laughs> his shorts. <laughs> I know a guy like that now. Yeah, yeah good fun, good fun. He, he was, he was a, a good guy, good guy, really fun guy. Um, but he was always a guy that I wanted to beat, but he was always just that little bit older and a little bit better than me at the time. So tell me, after the badminton, after you were a social badminton player, you obviously had a career in badminton. How did that come about? Um, basically towards towards the end of when I was playing. So I was still playing at the age of 34, 35. What, just social, um, just social playing? Or? No, playing, playing the, trying to play the tournaments. Did you? At that time in Scotland, we still had about eight or nine tournaments. Yeah. Um, so I would still be, I was still playing these. Um, were you working as well? Uh, were you I'm, working as well? Oh yeah, I, I was Did working you? from the age of 17. Did you? Um, yeah. So basically, to be honest, my my work funded my badminton. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and and, yes, and but, when it came to the decision of what job to do, what how did that come about as to what what you would take for a job? I talked to um, Jim Mailer, who got a job within Scottish Amicable, and he was allowed to leave early, and he could get days off, and he was you know they had good flexibility. Was that part of your decision making about getting no, the job? No, or? I, I never. I was never as good as somebody like Jim. Right. I, I was a decent county player. I, I never had. I never had the opportunity, or or wasn't good enough to be honest to play for German clubs or whatever in there. Club Club Badminton, yeah. Do that, or or get sponsorship from Carlton or Yonex. Yeah. Um. So basically, I had wanted to be a PE teacher when I was at school. Yes, because you loved sport. And I get the worst. I get the worst bit of advice ever. And if anybody's watching this, I had a careers advisor that said. Don't, don't be a PE teacher, there's not enough jobs, Brilliant. Uh, you'll find it hard to get into it. And basically my interest in school disintegrated mm, at that point. It's terrible. Um, and it's a, so, it's a, because I, I suppose they would say everybody wants to do sport. You know, if you say, if you say to a child, um, what do you want to do? And they'll say, well, and they'll say, well, I just don't know what I want to do. And you say, well, so what do you like? Oh, I like playing football. I like doing such a, well, come on, let's be serious. What do you want to do for a job? That's what you get, isn't it? And they're going to have that all day yeah. long, right? Yeah, but in saying that, this was about PE teaching. Yes, of this course. wasn't about professional yes, sport. Yes, that's right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and further, there was a lot of people doing it. Yes. She had no idea. She or he, I can't even remember who it was. Yeah, no idea. I had no idea how you know how passionate I was about what I was wanting to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, from that point, I I was pretty crap at school because I couldn't be bothered. What age were you then when that um, happened, Alan? I was about 15, yeah. 15, 16. Just took your mojo away. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, I still scraped through some hires and uh, a few hires and a few standard grades. But then I, I went 
and I joined uh, a company called Baron Strouds. I took an apprenticeship as an, an engineer there. Um, and I did mechanical engineer for 10 years. Really? Probably the worst mechanical engineer they really? ever had in Baron Strouds, but that's what I did. And that was just a means uh, for you to keep on playing badminton, was it really? Exactly. It, was a, it really was a means to an end. It was a means so that I could uh, have the funds to go and buy my rackets, my shuttles, pay for my court time and stuff like that. And also at the same time, the Coburn opened up. And for me and, and all the guys around my age, that became, I mean, we just hung out there. Amazing. That was, that was our home from home, literally. Our Straight home from, from work, home. right? Straight from work, we would go there, and if, if somebody hadn't turned up for a court, then we would use the court. Wow. Um, Is there anybody around that time, Alan, days. when you, you know, when you were at that stage, when you went to work at Barron's and all those things, was there was there any kind of, of your friends or anybody that you that you knew that was kind of living your dream as you wanted it? Do you, do you remember that? Is there anybody that you thought, God, he's got a great life, that guy's a PE teacher or a gym, somebody that works in a gym or somebody that works in Scotston or somebody that you thought, God, I wish that was my job? No, not really. So not, no, you're not just all really. in for your engineering. No. Yeah, good. And then, so how did... Yeah, I was... I was sorry. I was going to say, I was quite happy because at that point, I knew, I knew a lot of different players I had my car at that time because I had a job, I Money. could afford a car, so I could drive around to all the different clubs, uh, I would drive up to Stirling to play in the Stirling leagues, Did you? I saw you talk to Julie Hawk yeah. um, earlier on, so I used to play in the same leagues as Julie and things like that, used to play against Jim quite a lot as well. And, and um, that was all so the trappings was, of the money, yeah? Money. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, you actually had an income, you know, if you'd... I, I had, yeah, and and that was, for me, that was just the big thing. It meant that I could go to all the different tournaments and go to all the clubs and things like that. So I literally I was playing badminton seven nights a week. Did you? Wow. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And so tell me, how did you get from... From that to from that engineering career, from into what you, what you do, I guess yeah. From now, for what did, for how did you get into badminton after the engineering thing and working in that engineering for ten years? What what happened after that? Well, one of my mates, a guy called Walter Burns, had started restringing rackets and things like that. Hmm. And in those days, we were using gut. Yeah. Um. So I mean, I was going through like. <laughs> I don't know how many rackets, you know, because I was playing every day, yeah. so I was going through rackets like hell. Um, so I managed to persuade Walter to teach me how to string, Did you? and then we put some money in together and we started a small business. Well, wow. um, because you because you knew all the players, right? You knew all the players, I guess, right? We knew all the players, and we we got a space in the Coburn Centre. Wow, yeah. And we started a small shop there. It's now Gannon. Gannon I know. I had, I had, um, yeah. had Caitlin Pringle on. Did you hear that? that. I Sorry? had Caitlin Pringle on. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Caitlin's my god daughter. Is she? Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The poor girl. I never <laughs> let her forget it. <laughs> god help her. <laughs> Sorry, I'm yeah. only joking. I'm only joking. No, no. It's no. <laughs> so, yeah, so... Amazing. So then, then, so go on. So you started a shop and you got in. The, you got in. How? That's the dream, right? Getting into the Coburn Centre, was so, it? Yeah, no, that was great. That meant we were in the Coburn Centre. We had, uh, yeah, basically we started selling rackets, shuttles, um, and then we opened up in the Kelvin Hall as well. We had a shop there. Wow. And a guy called Ian Pringle uh, joined in with us as well. So Caitlin's dad. Yes. Um, yes. Oh, really. Yeah, so he joined in as well. And then at one point we had um, four shops on the go. Wow. And at that point, after the second shop, I had to make a decision whether to chuck the engineering and go into doing the shop really? full time, really? which is what I did. So, yeah, we, we had that for we had that shop for about 10 years, something sure. like that. Um, and then... Unfortunately, towards the end of that, uh, we had a shop in town that was sucking us dry. And, and we ended and all up, that stuff, yeah, right? We, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, at the time we hit a recession as well. 
So unfortunately, we, we lost the shops. And at that point, I was just getting into coaching, just mainly through helping players. Uh, but then I started to, people were actually paying me for it. That's great, yeah. And, and at that point, I wasn't taking a wage out of the shop because we couldn't afford it. So, so coaching then started to become my livelihood. Um, and also, to be honest, at the time, I was starting to realise that I could probably be a better coach than I was a player. Really, yeah. Yeah, and I desperately wanted to stay in badminton because yeah, that was the people in badminton were my, my best friends. That was my life. That was what I wanted to do. And how do you feel about I'm playing sure. now? Do you still play much? Do you play any club or do you? Do you how do you yeah. feel about playing at all now? I would love to be able to play, but my body is gone. My body's gone. I'm thirty kilos heavier than I used to be when I played. My knees are. If if somebody holds a shuttle on me, and turns me the wrong way, I think my knees would snap like twigs. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, def- definitely the body's going. I can stand in a corner and still hit. Yes. And I can do multi-feeding. Yes. But, um, yeah, that's, unfortunately, that's about it. Yeah, nowadays. it's hard, isn't it? I think, I mean, I struggle yeah. with I struggle with weight um, and I, st- I really have to fight to keep my weight off. My wife's quite thin and so she controls my diet and that kind of thing. But my discipline, my instinct and my hormones, like most of my family have, I say most of my family, actually, not so much now, but we're all quite big. You know, naturally, you know, if I, if I don't do a lot of exercise, you put, I put on three or four pounds a week. Just, just, it seems to be like that, you yeah. know, a fight, okay. it's a fight, you know. Um, but I do, I, yeah. I do have to, uh, yeah, I do exercise quite a lot to try and, to fight it, to be honest with you. It is a fight though, to, you know, it's my wife, it's just, you know, she couldn't put on weight. I'm just like, yeah. I'm a nightmare. But, uh, well, I, I used to be like that. They used to call me the weed. Really? Because really? I was so skinny, really? yeah, and then I then I became the fat wee, <laughs> and now I'm just now I'm just fat <laughs> or wee fat man. Yeah, you should get back to badminton. Get some, get some, get a pedometer. That's what I did. I got I got a pedometer and I lost in by doing ten thousand steps a day for six months. I lost my first stone just by walking, and I wouldn't go to bed until I've done ten thousand. And I just like I had a watch on. I look okay. at it and I say whatever, and it was just walking. I didn't even run; I just walked. And every day I said, "Right, I'm going to do that." And it's amazing how it works. Anyway, back to questions. Well, I was going to, I was going to start some uh, a GoFundMe for some liposuction. <laughs> so if, if you want to start that for me, uh, uh, not at all. All donations to <laughs> Alan McIlvain. Not at all. Um, so, do you still have a racket? And what is it? Uh, yeah, I use Yonex uh, now. Um, God, I've had the same one for about eight years. Nice. I think Nano 800. Oh, yeah, nice, yeah. Um, but that was mainly because it was quite light, so it was for feeding rather really? than anything else. Yeah. Um, so you don't play in any clubs at all? and you, so you've, where would, No, uh, what, when, I, when I came back, uh, Craig Robertson wanted me to go and play in his club. He's got um, some older guys are all playing at a club that he plays at. Is that Fault House? Uh, no, no. This was um, it's one down at the Coburn. Right. Um, so the plan was to do that. But as I say, since I get back, it's been locked down. Yeah, so of course. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been able to do anything. Um, tension. What, when you get a racket strung, what tension do you play with? Um, about 25, 26. 25, 26, just like me, good. Uh, family, have you got any family? Have you, have you, have you been married or that? Or have you got kids or that? Or? Nope. Unfortunately, Never badminton have. was my mistress. <laughs> and, and my wife. And, you, and everything else. Good for you, quite right as well. Uh, well, that's my excuse. I'm sure the girls that I dated probably said something different about why I'm single. <laughs> Not at all. Um, and, and what is it? So tell me about coaching. What are you? Uh, what kind of coach are you? Are you a, are you a, 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 a fun coach, a performance coach? Do you, are you strict? Are you about technique, tactics? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm supposed to be a performance coach, right? Um, but it's still fun. It's unless you're unless you're earning millions out of the game, then you still have to have that feeling of fun yeah. to want to do it. 
So although the sessions are hard and tough, I would like to think that everybody has a bit of fun during the session as well. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, my, my role is I'm the singles coach for Scottish Badminton right, now. Right. So I'm working with, mainly I'm working with the younger group of singles players. Is that Callum Smith? Uh, and the, uh, is that Callum Smith? Yeah, Cal, Callum's one of the guys I work with, yeah. And uh, Josh. Uh, ah, Pilger, yeah, yeah. Um, Good. Keir Pringle. Uh, Rachel Sugden, Holly, Holly Newell. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. She's coming uh, on next week. Okay, right. So there's there's six of them that I mainly work with. Brilliant. Um, and on a daily basis, and Kirsty a little bit as well. Yeah. And how do you find? Uh, how do you find? Uh, um, I've I've interviewed quite a lot of players now, and a lot of them. One thing I would probably say is they're all very serious and quite driven on it. And a lot of them, you know, very passionate and constant drive to beat the next person, the next person, the next person. And they do quite, I have to say, they take it quite seriously, right? I mean, not a lot of them have, have felt are big club players that just love badminton. I mean, Adam Hall loved it and couldn't get enough of it. Um, but quite a lot of them are just, you know, it is their, their job. So when they, so when do you, yeah. when do you coach them? Um, when are they all day I mean, long? What? It is basically their job. Is a it? few of them, are, yeah. A few of them are trying to. Well, it's an unpaid job, unfortunately. Is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. But a few of them are trying to to do university as well on a part time basis. I know. Basis. I know. Yeah. And to be honest, bad. We're we're lucky and unlucky in badminton, and that badminton players in general tend to be reasonably intelligent. Correct. Present company accepted, obviously. Um, but badminton players in general are quite an intelligent bunch, so usually they're all doing quite well at school or in university and things like that. Yeah. Um, I would like, I mean, it, so is, that, a, it is a concern. To, the financial side is definitely a concern of mine that, you know, that, that people have to make sacrifices and, and live pretty... Yeah. And, existences which wouldn't exist in England for example I feel it in England that somehow that they, they can just go and focus on badminton and be professional athletes and just I'm, I'm very interested I'm in, in my job I'm in commercial sales um, so I sell to business and I think I think there's a lot to learn in the skills of kind of marketing themselves towards businesses uh, to try and yeah. assist with funding and you know there's so many core values of these athletes that uh, you know they are their core values of cleanliness, competitiveness, um, trustworthiness, determination are all great business attributes. And I think you know if businesses could really turn towards that and kind of actually sponsor people. I know I know Callum Smith sponsor um, in the borders quite well, okay. Um, okay. quite well, and 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 just that attitude of you know that I just I just concern myself that so many people go by the wayside and they just think you know what. The battle with money and you know finding the time to do it and going to work wherever on a weekend or over night time or daytime or whenever it is, it just takes away your pressure. That you yeah. focus on the game. I just think the game could be better if if they could be given some. So I I would like to make some help. I would like to help with that really with players and try to help yeah. them kind of because I think that co there's all the coaching that you do and there's all the counselling that people get. But one thing they don't know is. How do you, somebody says to you, go and write a letter to such and such to try and get funding, to, to get assistance. And I don't know if that yeah. comes from anywhere, does it? I don't know, does it? I, I, I think Sports Scotland probably help a little bit in that. Yes. But um, I, I think it is definitely lacking. Yes. And, and to be honest, the players probably don't believe in themselves correct. enough uh, correct. To, to push themselves out there I, more. I agree. Uh, so there is definitely something that they could try and do a bit more, yeah. and, and could, could use help with to do a bit more. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely a, something there for for to, to assist players in in pitching in pitching themselves and and to yeah. finding the businesses that are doing well that are you know that have got a motivation to. I mean, I, I speak to the. 
I was speaking to a guy called Jesper, who's the head of sponsorship for Dan- Danish badminton a couple of weeks ago, uh, before I was ill. Okay. Before I was ill, and I was talking about the difference between Denmark and the UK. And he was just, he says, obviously things are hard with COVID at the moment. And he says, typically it's sports sponsors, it's people, you know, wearing t-shirts. I want to see you on TV wearing t-shirts, but that relies on being on telly, so that's not going to happen. Um, so, but yeah. so I just think there's a company I've yet uh, Danish badminton sponsored by Denisa, who's a make biscuits. Right, butter yeah. biscuits. I mean, there's like shortbread biscuits. Biggest sponsor for Danish badminton. What have they got to do with badminton or sport of any kind? Nothing. And it's just a case of just a, a familiarity and awareness. But he just talks about. He just talks about. It's mostly sold through. You know, the, it's all about presence. How many people are going to see Martin Hargrave? How many people are going to see? Yeah. You know, where are they going to be seen? Is he going to win those tournaments? When actually, I think there's probably more about core values of a business and a core value of a player and and assisting somebody local to them because everybody's trying to do business local to where they are, right? And then you've got a guy, yeah. Joe Bloggs, Adam Hall, who lives, who's from the village just over there, and you know we're supporting that business. We're supporting him, and that's great. I think. I think that's great you know so anyway that's that's yeah. a lot that's a lot of how i feel about the money side of things about how they need help and that's yeah, but about... it, would, it would certainly it would, it would certainly help if they could pull up a lot more sponsors but also for me there's things like some of the rules that bwf impose on the the shirt sponsorship really? as far as i'm concerned it should be like um like Formula One, you should be able to plaster yourself. Of course. You know, with Joe, Joe Bloggs, the butcher. Is that right? Is that what um, happens, so, is it? And if you could get, oh, you're only allowed, like, two adverts. And really? If you see the rules and regulations on the advertising on shirts and things, yeah. it's, re- it's ridiculous. Yeah. I think it was all about television at one point. Yeah, that's right. Um, that they, they couldn't have too much advertising, but if Formula One can have it, why can we not That's have exactly it? That's exactly right, yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, so these guys, uh, going back to what yes. we were talking Sorry. about before, these guys uh, tend to have to mix in their university with their playing, yeah. so we try and put a schedule in for them that they can train twice a day on court, really? Really? and also two times a week doing um, gym work as well. Does that mean that you have to work very flexible hours around that? Yeah, I, I tend to... I, I, I put in Saturday sessions uh, for somebody like Callum uh, who couldn't do all the regular sessions. Yes. Um, I do like a Wednesday evening, half five to half seven. Yeah. And also there's a Thursday evening, half four to half six. So these were slots that they didn't have before, but as far as I'm concerned, they're making a big effort uh, to try and get in for every session they can. Yeah. I'm paid to coach them, so I can afford to be a bit flexible about yeah, it. Yeah, and you're local enough to it, to the facility. And I'm local enough, and I don't have a family to worry about. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so basically, I'm yeah. quite happy to go in and do the hours when the players need to. Right, I'm going to leave it at that, but I'm going to come back to you and speak to you around two, if that's okay. Um, because it's ten past five, we've been chatting for an hour, and I've loved it. I've loved it, but I think I could talk oh, to you for. I think okay. I think I could talk for you for another hour. <laughs> but we'll leave, we'll leave it at that now because I'm, I'm interested in hungry. I'm interested okay. more on coaching. Um, but now we've got to now okay. we've got to know you, which is awesome. Um, and the next conversation, we can just dive into. I would like to talk about Hungary, Belgium, that career, and more, a lot more about Babington Scotland and the facilities and the and the coaching that you do. Right, that's brilliant. Okay. So yeah, good. great. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Okay. Thanks for that. Cheers. Thank-